All right. We're going to be studying Proverbs 12 today, which is exciting because Proverbs is God's book within the Bible of how to live your life. And it's a collection of short, concise phrases that basically rhyme with ideas to communicate so much wisdom through very few words, almost like a zip folder on a computer. These phrases were originally spoken by Solomon, a king of Israel, who when given one wish by God, Solomon asked for wisdom greater than all. All, you know, all others. And he got wisdom greater than all men, at least in his time. It is difficult to give summaries for chapters of Proverbs, but chapter 12 focuses generally on, like, the power of the tongue, truth versus lying, diligence versus laziness, and the righteous versus the wicked. So a lot of different topics being covered today. The three takeaways and will be in the last four verses today, and they are, one, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes, him glad, makes it glad. Uh, point two will be, but diligence is man's precious possession. And point three is, in the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. Can I go ahead and get someone willing to read um, verses one, two, and three for me, and I will shoot you twice to make you megaphoned. Raise your hand, come forward if you want to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Go on once. Go on twice. Sold to Zeke. <laughs> and you Testing should one, two. be megaphoned. Testing 1, 2. Am I a megaphone? Yes. You are, Testing but you're one. a bit quiet, so if you can up uh, your mic testing one two is that better perfect okay whoever loves instruction loves knowledge but he who hates correction is stupid a good man obtains favor from the lord but a man of the wicked intentions he will condemn a man is not established by wickedness but the root of the righteous cannot be moved. Thank you for reading, Zeke. I really appreciate it. And so what we can start learning from this first section is <laughs> how could you learn unless you are corrected? You know, that, that's pretty much what verse one is saying. Uh, not letting pride get in the way and being humble goes a long way to being able to take corrections from other others. Now, stupid in the original he Hebrew here is closer to brutish or behaving like an animal. Animals are controlled by instinct and are unable to learn from criticism or communication of other animals, really. They're, any person who gets angry when corrected rather than taking the criticism to heart has as little chance to make progress morally as an animal. Uh, people like that may say things like, don't confuse me with facts. My mind is already made up, you know? Or they might hide that under a facade of, you know, uh, other words. But then when we move on to verse two, it starts talking. Oh, it starts talking about favor from the Lord, and I just want to point, highlight how useful favor favor from the Lord is. Psalm five verses verse twelve says, "For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor." You will surround him as with a shield. Psalms 37 and Psalm 84, 11 also talk about this kind of shield protection. Psalm 35 says, for his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. <laughs> you know, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. So again, we see that the Lord's favor lasts for a lifetime. So it's, it's a shield that can last a long time when you get it. Now, examples of people who had God's favor are Noah, you know, in Genesis 6, 8. And actually, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah. There we go. I was already there. 
Uh, examples of people who had God's favor are Noah, and I'll just let you read the verses by yourself. Abraham, Lot, Naphtali, Moses, Esther, Samuel, Gideon, Mary, and Jesus. And so, uh, and I'll just encourage Donoa to go ahead and uh, mute yourself just because I can hear the feedback of myself talking. But that's just a recommendation, and I'll just keep going, ignoring the feedback. Anyways, or actually, I could even shoot you three times if I really need to, but we'll do that if I hear it more. Uh, ways to get, so if God's favor is so great and so wonderful, what ways can we do that? Uh, one is we can learn these wise sayings. And I apologize, but I'm going to go ahead and find my pistol and keep reading <laughs> about this verse. All right. Well, I'll look for it and, and while someone else is reading the next set passage. Uh, learning these wise teachings, Proverbs... Uh, 8.35 says, for whoever finds me, the personification of wisdom, finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4 and Proverbs 13, 15. Now, another way we can gain favor, surprisingly to me, was to be married. Proverbs 18.22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. A third way to obtain favor from God is to be humble, according to Proverbs 3.34. And a fourth way is to be a good person, as we hear, read here in verse 2. Um, now we can finally move on to verse 3, and we can talk quickly, just quickly, about how two Sundays ago, when discussing about righteousness, 11 verses were referenced about how the righteous are protected. This verse 3 here continues the theme of the righteous being protected. All right, can I go ahead and get someone willing to read it verse 4, 5, and 6 for me while I run into my desk trying to find my pistol? <laughs> Okay, uh, it might have fallen through the floor or something. Well, I'll go ahead and who would like to read verses 4, 5, and 6? Anyone raising their hands? Uh, do you want to read it, Do Donna? Uh, Donoa. Okay, I can go. Uh, that makes sense. Would you like to read verses four, five, and six here? Um. Wait. Do you need that one? Okay. Uh, sure. sure. An excellent wife is is the crown of her husband, but she he, but she who causes her shame is is like rottenness is in her bones, and the the thoughts of the righteous is all right, but but the the counsel of the the uh, wicked is it the deceitful? Oh, the words of the words of the wicked are lie in weight of blood, and but but the mouth of of the upright will will deliver them. Thank you so much for Thank reading. Thank you so much for reading. I'll go ahead and de megaphone you real quick. And one more. There we go. Oh, apparently the 
third time doesn't do it. Let's try it one more. All right, there we go. Nope. <laughs> uh, I don't understand these systems sometimes. We because so we tried to program it so that it would uh, take people off megaphone, but it doesn't work as intended sometimes. Okay, uh, continuing on. So what we, what we can learn from verses four, five, and six is that it is hard to watch those with rottenness in their bones, especially young couples. You know, um, <laughs> elderly individuals with uh, bones have to be cautious at all times to be able to do anything. It only takes one fall to the ground to be a hospital trip. So when a wife causes shame, it causes the husband to feel fragile and cautious. Luckily, the reverse can be true. An excellent wife can give confidence to a husband and be someone the husband always wants to highlight. Now, the thoughts of the righteous are right, getting to verse 5. It's when you read that, it's a hard pill to swallow, but the battle to be righteous is in the thoughts, not just the action. The reason is that our thoughts and desires will eventually turn into actions. James 1.15 says that when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So to stop bad act, uh actions we need to control guide and direct our thoughts as second corinthians 10 second half of verse 5 says bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ now how do we control our thoughts we by choosing in those moments to think about good things philippians 4 8 says finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report it, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy meditate on these things so that's what we can learn from verse 5 can I get another reader for verses 6, 7, and 8? We'll be peru uh, skipping through a lot of these. Um, death Razor! 1 and... So it says right. you're on megaphone? Perfect. Yeah, um, I don't know what your camera angle is, because like 6 for me is like way over here, and then 7 and stuff right here. So, seven, the eight, words nine. of the wicked are... Lie and wait for blood, Hello. but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The wicked are overthrown, and no more. But the house and the righteousness will stand. A man will be commended according to his wisdom, but he who is a preserved heart will be despised. Better is the one who is slighted, but who has the servant, than he who honors himself but lacks bread. So quickly, I'm just going to say, and when looking at verse 9, to be slighted is to be lightly esteemed or to feel insulted because someone has done or said something that shows that they think you are not important. I like to, to think of it as being humbled. So it's better to have no honor than to have, uh, it's better to be without honor than to have not with honor. <laughs> uh, provisions are better than honor in essence. Um, honoring yourself, by the way, is really unwise in general. And thank you. Now, uh, moving on to verses 10, 11, and 12. Uh, can I go ahead and have Death Razor just go ahead and read this since you're already megaphoned? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, let's you? see here. Let me just... I'm going to move over here so I'm in view here. Um... Let's see. A righteous man reg regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolously is devoid of understanding. The wicked covet is the catch of an evil man, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. Thank you. I'll go ahead and unmute from you. And go ahead and drop that. So <laughs> I think it's wild that verse 10 even exists in the Bible because 
the you know the Bible is so heavenly about how God's relationship to us humans, right? But when we look at verse ten, righteous people pr- probably understand that treating a life well means that entity will probably treat you back well. I wonder if the righteous can also empathize with animal animals, since often followers of Jesus feel like sheep themselves. So let's. Let's just take a second to recognize there is a place in verse 10 to be kind to animals in the Bible. Now, moving on to verse 11, diligence is key to supply for one's self. So don't just follow, you know, do frivolous things all the time because that person is devoid of understanding. Um, Verse 12 when we move on to that one, is really focusing on coveting. I think verse 12 works as a good test if you're coveting. Um, Because do you desire the riches that that evil people are able to collect so easily? You know, (laughs) then that's coveting. Uh, You know, If you catch yourself coveting in your thoughts, remember to think about what is true, noble, just, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. What is virtuous and what is praiseworthy? You know, that's because the battle to be righteous is in the mind, not in the, you know, not in the actions. All right, can I go ahead and get another reader for verses 13, 14, and 15, please, while I try to figure out this stuff. Uh, there's my pistol. Um, okay, Infinite J. So one and two. You should be megaphone now. Go ahead and read Hello? verses 13, 14, and 15. Over there. Yep, All right. I can hear you. <clears throat> <clears throat> the wicked is ensnared, ensnared by the trans, transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the, recom, the recomp, recompense of a man's will be rendered to him. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Wow. Thank you for reading so much. Uh, let me go ahead and shoot you one more time to get you off megaphone. Thank you. And then uh, what we can learn from verse 13 is, <laughs> and 14 is that what a person speaks and does will be repaid back. Um, At first glance, many of these proverbs about being prudent, diligent, and understanding to get good, they seem obvious. Yet while we live in a culture, that culture has disconnected character from destiny. It used to be that culture taught if you worked hard and and played it straight, you would be destined for success success. Instead, what is taught today is you get ahead by bending the law as much as you can without breaking it. So I just discourage, you know, I want to encourage you, the more you improve your character towards righteousness, the more you chance, that really increases your chances because God becomes your protector of having a, you know, uh, of being protected of being delivered, of, you know, be, you know, have good things, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyways, moving on to verse 15, where I'm going to be parking for a while, determining things in your own eyes is, is really bad. So don't do it. Uh, (laughs) Don't do what is right in your own eyes, but what it, it, but what is right in God's eyes, who decides right from wrong. Um, you know, so <laughs> this phrase appears really often in the Bible because it's you, no, what we're not supposed to do. Israel was actually commanded in Deuteronomy 12, 8, you shall not at all do as we are doing here today, 
every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. And then, yet, yeah, unfortunately, they didn't listen in Judges 17.6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's so bad that in, you know, so that's what Israel did, that in Psalm 36, 1 through 2, when describing the wicked, it nearly lists this as the first criteria. And I quote, an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatten, flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. Uh, uh, Isaiah 5.21 can, says similarly, Woe, a.k.a. tragedy, to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Now, when we get to, we get, then have to ask the question, why? Why is it so bad to, you know, do what is right in your own eyes? And the answer to that is because God decides what is right, right and wrong, not us. Proverbs 16.2 says, All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. Again, Proverbs 21.2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. So instead of deciding what is right and wrong among us, ourselves, we should fearfully respect what God has decided as right and wrong. Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Whenever we are tempted to do what we think is right in our own eyes, we need to do what this verse 15 here says, heed counsel. When figuring out the right thing to do, ask yourself, if the idea came from worldly ideas or heated counsel from the Bible. Ultimately, let's follow Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, um, where, sorry, yeah. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Can I go ahead and get another reader for verses 16, 17, and 18? Uh, go ahead and raise your hand and come forward and jump up and down if you're on on desktop. Do, do, do. Going once. Going twice. And sold to no one. I'll go ahead and read. Verses, uh, verse 16, a fool's wrath is known at once. But a prudent man covers shame. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Okay, so what, okay, what, what can we learn from these little parables? Well, I think it's worth pointing out from verse 16 when it's talking about fools and, you know, fools' wrath, it reminds me a lot of Ecclesiastes 5.3. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Prudent people are those who think about future consequences. The future consequence of showing mercy by covering shame is that it will create more peace with the person. Now, Proverbs 17.9 expands on this idea by saying these kind of people seek love, the ones that are willing to cover shame. And I quote, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. <laughs> so fools must not realize that wrath and anger turn people away. Those who are merciful and patient are the ones people flock to. Um, can I go ahead and get another, or no? Uh, I've got one more point to make um, about verse 18, that our speech and words can hurt people. 
those who are wise would rather use their words to help others because they first were helped by God. <coughs> Sorry about that. Words are an inexpensive way to build up others. And as others improve, the community improves. And as the community improves, everyone in the community benefits, including the same wise person who built others up. But now, can I actually get a, another reader for verses 19, 20, and 21 over here? That would be wonderful. So, if I go like that. Um, got my pistol out. Uh, we've got Mega Destroyer 18. Thank you so much for being willing to read. You are now megaphoned. All good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. These three? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> the truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. No grave trouble will overtake the righteous, but the wicked shall be filled with evil. Perfect. Thank you for reading. Um, I really appreciate it. It really helps break up a lot of my words and allows me to get a chance to recover my thoughts. Um, verse 19, we can mention that the Bible has more to say about the abuse of the tongue, lying, than it has to say about the use and abuse of alcohol. That can, you know, So I think that helps keep things in perspective how much the Bible cares about what we say. Now, I wonder if deceit is in the heart, in verse 20, is referring to living lying to yourself. Like, lying to yourself that you are doing good when going over the speed limit to get to school on time. Or, I, God sure hates it when God, good and evil are swapped. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. When we get to verse 21, though, we can start talking about how, uh, you know, to clarify, righteous people will still have trouble. You know, I know it says that no grave trouble will overtake the righteous, but the righteous will still have trouble. They just will not be overtaken by it. Noah had a flood wipe out nearly all those he knew. Job had health and every possession, possession taken from him. Daniel was taken into captivity into Babylon practically in his teens. The trouble did not defeat or overtake any of them, but boy, did they have a lot of trouble. And I just, I got to point out, in Ezekiel 14, verses 13 through 15, Noah, Daniel, and Job, the person I, people I just listed, were the only ones given as examples that would survive a famine due to their righteousness. I quote, son of man, when the land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine upon it, on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Wild, right? <laughs> you know. Uh, I think in the context of Ezekiel, if you're curious, he was talk. It's the people of that time thought that they just needed a righteous per person among them, so God wouldn't judge them. Like if only they had Daniel, if only they had Job, if only they had Noah. Um, but you know, if you think back to like the story of Lot, who uh, he was when that whole land was being unrighteous, what God did instead of protecting the land because of Lot, who was, you know, uh, at least had the favor of the Lord, and we, I think he was right, uh, probably righteous, what ended up happening was God called Lot out of that land and then judged the land. But anyways, that was a side tangent that I had fun with, because I feel like I have too much, I have enough time to do that today, which is very rare. And 
but I get annoyed by how the grabbing mechanism of Rec Room works. But anyways, uh, so why will no grave tr trouble overtake the, the righteous? It's very specifically because the righteous are protected by God. Um, the God is their protector. Psalm 512 says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. Isaiah 59:17 and Ephesians 6:14 even compare righteousness to a breastplate. Other verses that talk about um, and I'll talk about the righteous being protected are all listed right here. And you can see, like, again, there's like around 10 or 11 verses and talking about how the righteous are protected. Um, and so just keep that in mind as you pursue God, as you decide to become more righteous by being renewed in mind and spirit, by pursuing him, by learning the Bible, by le learning what God considers good and evil, where, you know, all of those things, you will slowly become more and more protected because the righteous are protected. Okay, can I get another reader for verses 22, 23, and 24, please? Uh, raise your hand, come forward, all that good stuff while I try to lower this. Anyone? And if you're on desktop, feel free to jump up and down so I can see you. Why? 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 <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, we've got, uh, oh, you want to read? Go for it. Uh, so one, two, and now you should so can be you on hear me? megaphone. Yep, I can hear you. Go ahead and read verses 22, lying 23, lips, and 24 for lying me. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. A prudent man conceals knowledge. But the heart of fools proclaims foolishness. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Thank you so much for reading. I'll go ahead and show you one more time to take you off the megaphone, and then we'll go ahead and continue service. <laughs> continue. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being a part of the service and reading. Um, so I'm going to be using verse 22, where lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. If lying is bad enough to be called an abomination to God, how bad is being an abomination exactly? And I will take this opportunity to compare to a sample of other abominations that lying is being grouped in with. One, a person who justified the wicked or condemns the righteous is an abomination. Two, a person who is proud in heart. Three, a person with a crooked heart. Four, a devious person. Five, the way of the wicked is an abomination. Six, thoughts of the wicked are an abomination. Seven, the sacrifices of the wicked are an abomination. Eight, a person who practices witchcraft, soothsaying, interpreting omens, sorcery, spells, or being a medium for the spirits of the dead. And <laughs> I, can, I can totally count. Five, six, seven, eight. Nine, trading incorrect amounts, which has actually got like many verses, like four different verses. Ten, money earned through male or female prostitution is an abomination. I think we're at 11, remarrying a first husband after divorcing and marrying a second husband. And then 12, a carved or cast metal image probably to be worshipped. Uh, even the silver or gold in that carved image is an abomination to the Lord. 13, anything people exalt instead of God, according to Luke 16:15. And let's end this list with Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, which says, In a, uh, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are our abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. So in conclusion, 
<laughs> lying is pretty bad if it's being grouped in with the wicked, with witchcraft, and shedding innocent blood, aka murder. Now, move, finally moving on to verse uh, 35, we've got that wise people realize knowledge is strength. Uh, as Proverbs 24, verse 5 says, a wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. Uh, yep, right there. And then what's uh, these... It is worth keeping in mind that without love, knowledge is nothing. 1 Corinthians 13.2 explains that saying, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And so and then when we finally move on to the verse 4, which... Um, as employers realize a person is diligent and can be trusted, they will give greater and greater responsibility to that person. These promotions lead the person to manage more and in a sense rule over others. The opposite happens to lazy people. They don't get promoted. They get inspectors actually assigned over them to force them to get things done. Luke 16 verses 10 through 14 says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is in unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, or money, you who will commit to your trust the true riches. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, what will you... Who will give you what is your own? Now, as we try to summarize these Proverbs, it becomes clear these Proverbs always take the long-term perspective. The Proverbs encourage us to take a path you would have chosen if you were at the end of the road looking back. The path you wish you would have taken. That, to me, is really encouraging. Can I get another reader for verses 25, 26, and 27? Some of the big takeaways today. Um, right over here. Uh, we got Zeke jumping up and down. I'll take a Zeke. Testing one, two. Microphone? Yep, can hear you. Uh, 25, 26, and 27. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Righteous should choose his friends carefully. From the way of the wicked leads them astray. The lazy man does not roast what he, what he took in hunting, but diligence is a man's precious possession. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for reading with so much energy, Zeke. I really appreciate it. So... 25 we it's really this time i decided to just choose three of the verses as the different takeaways in verse 25 is our takeaway anxiety in the heart of man causes depression but a good word makes it glad um the word for depression here is a primitive root to depress or make small although the word commonly refers to people bowing down here, figuratively, the word means to make the heart small. Most translations replace the word depression with weighs it down, weighs down the heart. Weighing the heart down, I think, gets across the idea the heart isn't in a good place. So, you know, however you read it, it's not a good place to be. So worry or anxiety is not good for the heart is then what this verse is implying because it's not a, the heart's not in a good state. But what is this anxiety exactly? Now, the Strong's Concordance labels this Hebrew word for anxiety as carefulness or fear or heaviness or sorrow. It's almost like this anxiety is when you are so careful, you are fearful, burdened, and sad. 
Now remember, we have nothing to be afraid of when we are laser focused on how God saved each of us for eternal life. Romans 8 verses 31 32 says, What then shall we say to those things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he uh, not, not with him also freely give us all things? Similarly, in Hebrews 13 6, it says, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So, therefore, I'm sorry I didn't move it for the previous point, but I get to move it now. Um, believers, uh, <laughs> therefore, whenever we are anxious, simply pray about the fear to God. Do not, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You can also look in 1 Peter uh, 5, 7. Having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you. So, Anxiety is bad, right? We've established that we don't need to be anxious because we don't need to be afraid because God is our helper when we're laser focused on how God saves us for eternal life. However, planning ahead without fear is a good thing. Proverbs 21, 5 says, The plans of the diligent certainly lead to advantage, but everyone who is in a hurry certainly comes to poverty. Proverbs 14, 15 similarly says, The simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Oh, now, when we finally move on to start talking about, oh, wow, I have a decent amount to talk about. Uh, verse we we'll finally move on to verse 26, to, which kind of seems to give the impression that, you know, friend, we shouldn't be hanging out with unbelievers. We are to hang out with unbelievers. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Colossians 4, verses 5 through 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. 1 Corinthians 10.27 says, If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. Finally, Jesus also ate with sinners. Mark 2, verses 16 through 17 says, And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him, Jesus, eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to the righteous, to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. However, intimate friends, are those whose, you know, those whose advice you listen to should be fellow righteous, wise Christians. And, you know, because that's really what verse 26 here is getting at. And you can see this echoed in Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Proverbs 13.20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And another good verse to check out is Proverbs 22, verses 24 through 25, but we don't have that time now for that. So now we move on to verse 27, where it's talking about this whole, and we've gotten to our second takeaway, but the Diligence is man's precious possession. So the lazy person didn't cook his meal, right? He does only what is absolutely necessary and suffers for it. In this case, the lazy person probably got food poisoning because he probably ate the food without cooking it. The, on the other hand, the diligent are the ones who treat whatever they have as precious. Diligence sometimes feels like a possession that can be lost, by the way. 
once retired, it's hard to go back to work. Once working, it's hard to go back to school. Gaining diligence is much harder than just keeping it. Now, for the last verse today, can I have our final reader read just literally one verse for us? Uh, go ahead, your, uh, yours. I apologize. I saw yours first, but uh, if you sh uh, next Sunday, I'll have to remember Michael to be able to call on you. Check my. Go ahead my and read uh, twenty-eight. Yours. Okay. And the way of right, right, righteousness is life, and it is that way there is no death. Perfect. Thank you. And what I can explain about this <laughs> is the gospel, basically, which is really exciting. And we're, I'm going to actually be teaching about the gospel next Sunday in 1 Corinthians 15. A little sneak preview into that. I've only gotten like ten verses, eight verses into that notes, but we'll finish that up. Uh, so we have reached our third takeaway in the way of righteousness life and its pathway there is no death. God is not saying here that people with their own righteousness will live eternally. Jesus clarifies in Matthew 5:20, "For if I say to you that unless your unrighteous or your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, aka the religious leaders at that time, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven." Solomon also says in Ecclesiastes 7.15, I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Noah, Daniel, and Job, God himself gives us examples of great righteousness. In Ezekiel 14, thir verses 13 and 14, yet they all died. God protected them, so they each lived a long life for their time, though. Noah, 950 years, Job, maybe around 210, and Daniel, over 100 years. However, so although we can't attain eternal right, uh, life with our own righteousness, we can receive Jesus' righteousness by confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart that Jesus died paying for our sins and rose from the dead. Then we have accepted Jesus' free gift of salvation and will have eternal life. We will be judged as innocent, effectively making us righteous. Romans 10.9 says that if we, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 Peter 2.24 similarly says, He, Jesus, himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, or cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So the three takeaways today were, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Second point is that Diligence is a man's precious possession. And the third point today is in the way of righteousness is life. And in its pathway, there is no death. Now, in this last verse, we talked about how our righteousness is not enough. We need Jesus' free gift of righteousness to live eternally. So I encourage you, seek Jesus. Seek Jesus by having a relationship with him. Pray. Read his Bible with instructions so you can gain wisdom and live. Get connected with other Christians who can share what God has done with them and pray with you. So if you'd like to begin your relationship with God today with all the wisdom that relationship provides, we have people here who would be willing to pray with you, especially Zeke, the head of the prayer team, and I would be willing to pray with you. And even, I'm sure, Phantom Mythos and Aaron would be open to praying with someone if they wanted to. Uh, and then, if, you know, if you're uncertain, I beg for you to pray for God to reveal himself to you. If you've been pursuing God for a while, don't hesitate to get prayer for whatever you are going through. We have the opportunity to boldly go before the throne of grace at any time, so don't pass up this opportunity to receive more mercy and grace. 
Thank you so much for coming, and let's close in prayer. Go ahead, and Zeke, uh, finish us off with a word of prayer, and I'll go ahead and even megaphone you, because I can think ahead. Uh, Testing perfect. one, two. Yep. God, the Son, Jesus, thank you for this wonderful message, and I pray everyone watching this on YouTube or your favorite media platform that the message comes that you receive Jesus' uh, message through this uh, video and that he will speak to you and give you life. In Jesus' name, amen.